Human beings act. Now, that probably sounds like the most ridiculously obvious and silly statement I could possibly make right now. But when we actually start to look at the implications of that, when we really consider deductively and logically what the meaning of human action truly is, we start to understand a more profound and vast world of knowledge than we could possibly have considered, having just laughed at the idea that human beings act is a silly and pointless statement. Today on Heretical History, in the second episode of Approaches to History, our introductory series, we are going to talk about economics. And I know it sounds dull and dismal, but trust me on this one, it's not at all. It's quite the opposite. It is the fundamental, basic, most important, and fascinating foundation upon which all of history, indeed the entire way the world works, is going to be laid. So join me today as we discover choices and challenges. I'm your host, Tom Thorne, and I'm happy to welcome you to Heretical History. The great economist Ludwig von Mises, an Austrian who lived in the early to mid-20th century, wrote a massive work called Human Action in the 1950s. And in Human Action, Mises does exactly what I just described. He takes the statement, human beings act, and he carries it out to all of its conceivable implications, all of the various ways in which that statement can be unpacked and unfolded to explain the world around us and to figure out just what we're trying to do as historians, to figure out how the world works. In Human Action, Ludwig von Mises defines action as purposeful behavior with a goal. Now, what that means is that involuntary behavior, such as flinching when you are punched, or, um, or, or having your knee shake when you are uh, hit with a hammer on the knee, like they do at the doctor's office, um, these kinds of involuntary responses to stimuli that your body does on a biological, nervous, reactive basis, these things do not count as action. Action is making a choice. Action is purposeful behavior meant to attain a certain end or aim or goal. That's what human action entails, and that's what we're going to be talking about today as we discuss economics, as we discuss the foundation of how and why people act the way they do in the world. Now, there's a very important assumption that Mises made in the book, Human Action, that is completely true, and so it's a totally safe assumption to make. This assumption is that the world we live in is one of scarcity rather than abundance. And I know you probably live in America or a European country, which is very prosperous, and you see the fruits of prosperity and what we call abundance around us, but it still doesn't mean that we live in a Garden of Eden situation. If we lived in a Garden of Eden situation, we would not have to worry about things like poverty and unemployment. Indeed, we, we actually wouldn't have to have any employment if we lived in the Garden of Eden and could have whatever we wanted whenever we wanted it on demand, right? If you could just pick whatever food you wanted right off the ground because God has given it to you, wouldn't that be nice? If you could just have whatever kind of nice luxury items, any couch to lay on, any house to live in, any sweet swimming pool to swim in, 
whenever you wanted it, that would be pretty awesome. But none of us can have that. Even if you're Bill Gates, even if you are one of the wealthiest people in the world, you still have economic restraints placed on you by the fact that we live in a world of scarcity. And of course, this is all very obvious, but it's easy to lose sight of it once we start going into more complicated and advanced topics in economics and history. So it's really important to hammer this point home now, right as we're beginning, that we live in a world of scarce, limited resources, meaning we cannot achieve our goals or our aims in any way that we like. We cannot instantly have whatever we want, which is why, according to Mises, it is necessary to act. If we could have whatever we wanted whenever we wanted it in a Garden of Eden abundant situation, there would be no reason to set goals or aims or desires for the future and to plan and act accordingly. We would simply pick the fruit off the ground and eat it. We would simply dive into that nice swimming pool which would magically appear before us whenever we wanted it. We would simply lie down on that nice silken couch whenever we felt we needed a rest. That would be wonderful, but that's not the world we live in, of course. So what Mises points out in his book Human Action, and what's going to inform and guide us for the rest of our talk today, and actually for the entire rest of this series, is the fact that human beings must act to achieve their goals given the scarcity of resources in the world around them. In other words, we have theoretically limitless desires. We can want whatever we want. We can dream up just about anything for us to attain, but for the most part, we can't attain it. And we certainly can't attain it without acting. The only way we can get even close to attaining our wild fantasies is by planning and acting, by making choices, by engaging in purposeful behavior towards a goal. So this is the basic concept, and I'm sorry for repeating it. I know it gets kind of dull after a while, but it's really important to keep hammering this home, to make sure that we all understand this so that when we go forward, we don't give way to any kinds of wishful thinking, and you'll be surprised how much of this there is in the world, how much wishful kind of uh, whimsical Garden of Eden thinking there is when people start to forget the limitations of scarcity and the implications of that for human action, the limits that that places on what we can achieve. So, because we live in a world of scarcity, but we have limitless desires, we have to make choices as to how we are going to act, how we are going to allocate our resources. As economists say, our land, our labor, and our capital are our main resources. How we are going to act and allocate our resources to achieving our ends. And the better we do that, the more efficient we are. So, the more effective our allocation of resources through action ends up being is the more effect is the more um the more efficient in economic terms that our action that our purposeful behavior is in attaining our goal so because we have to make choices this implies that we have values because if we if we didn't have values we'd never be able to decide on what choice to make, or there wouldn't even be a series of choices, right? We would always just do one thing. But we all have different evaluations, as economists would say, of different goals and outcomes, and of different ways of achieving those goals and outcomes. So, to give an example, I may really like apples, and my friend may really like oranges. 
if I want to grow the best apples, I am going to have to allocate my land, my labor, and my capital goods, things like tools and, uh, and watering hoses and that kind of stuff, to the growth of apple trees. My friend, let's call him Steve, is going to have to allocate his land, his labor, and his capital, assuming he has all of those things, to growing orange trees. Because he wants oranges, and I want apples. We have different values in this case. And that's totally fine. There is no objective superiority between, uh, you know, between apples and, and oranges. Neither one is necessarily better than the other. It's completely subjective, and depends on the person. Now, this is not to say, please don't mistake me and call me a relativist, this is not to say that when we get into philosophical and ethical ideas much later on, that that is totally subjective. That's not what I'm saying. But economic values, the allocation of resources to attaining certain uh, physical, material, economic goals... That is wholly subjective, and totally fine that it's that way. It should be subjective. That's what individuality and diversity of opinion really amounts to. And it's from this subjectivity that we get such a wide range of choices available to us when we start allocating our scarce or limited resources in a whole array of different manners to achieve a whole array of different goals. Now, this brings us to a second great economic thinker who is not necessarily a trained economist like Ludwig von Mises, but was more of a popularizer of economics. His name was Henry Hazlitt, and he lived in the kind of mid to late 20th century. Now, Hazlitt's great work that I would recommend for anyone no matter what your level of understanding of economics is, whether you're a total novice or a trained economist. Hazlitt's great work is called Economics in One Lesson. It's very easy to read. It's not that long. I strongly recommend checking it out. It's a lot of fun, and it'll give you a really neat perspective on the world that's going to guide us for the rest of our conversation. Hazlitt built on these ideas of human action in a world of scarcity that Mises had deduced and popularized them, making them accessible to ordinary people. And his main contribution in this book, Economics in One Lesson, is this one lesson. Look for the unseen or hidden costs of any given action rather than simply looking at the obvious benefits of that action. Now, this flo follows totally logically. It falls out just the way we think it should from what we were talking about a minute ago, with the fact that we have to make choices given the scarcity and limitations of our resources. The choices that we make always create what economists call opportunity costs. Opportunity costs are everything you could be doing, so it's basically infinite. All the infinite things that you could be doing but are not doing because you are making the choice that you are making. In other words, they are all the various ways that you could be allocating your resources to attain a whole variety, theoretically infinite variety of different aims and outcomes that you are not choosing to pursue while you are directing your human action, your purposeful behavior, to attaining the goal that you are trying to attain. So let's go back to our apples and oranges example. Steve is growing an orange tree. What he's not doing while he's allocating his land, his labor, and his capital to growing the orange tree is growing an apple tree. That's left to me. This is called the division of labor, which we can talk about later. But the, uh, the, the, the basic premise here is that Steve is choosing not to do a whole variety of things. In addition to not growing an apple tree, he's also not building a house. He's also not reading a book. He's also not studying to become a doctor. He's also not performing open-heart surgery and making a lot of money doing so. 
he is growing an orange tree. And it's very important to keep this in mind, because it brings us back to the one lesson that Henry Hazlitt wants us to understand and that we absolutely need to grasp if we are going to be good historians, or good economists for that matter. But since this is a history show, we want to relate things to the past and how human beings have acted so we can understand how the world works. Henry Hazlitt's one lesson of looking for the hidden costs in addition to the obvious benefits of an action is exactly this concept of opportunity costs. And throughout our entire show, not just this episode or even this series approaches to history, but the entire podcast series of heretical history, we are going to be taking this one lesson of Henry Hazlitt and applying it to a whole variety of things, to just about everything that has ever happened in human history, insofar as we can discuss, given the limitations of our podcast, right? We're going to be applying this one lesson of look for the opportunity costs, look for the unseen hidden costs, the things that you don't necessarily pick up on when you just look at the surface, but that are extremely important to considering the various problems with certain actions throughout history. And this plays out in a huge array of policies and large-scale kind of macro-historical or macro-economic decisions that very important people have made throughout history. Let's take, for example, wartime military spending. This is something that you will see repeated again and again throughout history, is historians love to praise, and we'll get to this in a couple of episodes, why this is and what the problems with it are, but historians by and large love to praise vigorous, strong, powerful military leaders. And we'll talk about why in a bit, not in this episode, but again, a couple podcasts down the line. Historians love the ruthless, dictatorial, brutal leaders of, of ages past. Not so much the fascist and communist dictators that we know today from the 20th century, just because the memory of their horrible policies are so recent. But evil, brutal, tyrannical people throughout history have always been praised by lapdog court historians, both in their time and in the future. Now, how does this relate to Henry Hazlitt's one lesson? Well, the reason that people often praise military leaders is that they stimulate their economies. This is, this is a, a, a concept that we get from a lot of economic historians, as well as a lot of modern-day economists and modern-day historians, who will tell us that war is good for the economy as a whole of any given society because it stimulates spending. Now, on the surface, that sounds totally correct, right? Let's say in World War II, it's a perfect example. In World War II, the United States government poured billions of dollars into fighting the Nazis. And we're not going to get into the historical question of whether or not the United States should have been in the Second World War. That's something we can discuss in a much later show, and I'm sure we will. But for now, let's just talk about the immediate economic choices that Franklin Delano Roosevelt and his brain trusters and the people in the high ranks of the United States government during the war made. They chose to pour billions of dollars that had been taken from taxpayers into wartime spending. And that wartime spending went to the construction of tanks and planes and battleships, to the uh, manufacture of arms and munitions and foodstuffs and other supplies for soldiers, and to all kinds of other things that, that relate to you know, to paying the soldiers, to paying the officers, anything you can think of that would relate to the war effort. Now, historians and economists for a long time praised, and many still continue to praise, 
the U.S. government for its involvement in the economy during World War II. Because they say that this spending, this government intervention, got us out of the Great Depression, which of course had been going on for a decade before the war. However, there's always, 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 always a hidden cost, as Mr. Hazlitt would remind us. And applying the one lesson here shows some very fundamental flaws in what the U.S. government was doing and what all the governments of the world, I'm not just picking on America because I'm American, but what all the governments of the world were doing during World War II and in any other war in human history. The fundamental flaw is that we're not noticing the hidden costs, the opportunity costs, of how that money taken from the taxpayers and distributed to a variety of military-industrial complex interests to fund, the war in, to fund the war effort, we're not looking at how the money could have been spent had it not been taxed from the people and spent in this variety of ways. So, that is the one lesson. What could have been spent was investment in what consumers actually wanted, you know, cars instead of tanks, or commercial planes instead of fighter jets, or, um, or, or, or say, food to put on people's dinner plates, rather than rations for the soldiers. Of course, we don't think about this when we just take the conventional or mainstream approach to history, which forgets Henry Hazlitt's one lesson and does not look at the opportunity costs, or the hidden costs, the unseen problems that human action creates. And so, this is the approach that we're going to be taking throughout the show to not just economic matters, but political matters as well, and social changes, and, and even cultural and intellectual matters throughout history. We're going to be applying the lessons of Henry Hazlitt and Ludwig von Mises, the fact that human beings act in a world of scarcity that we must not forget, and that the choices that stem from this reality of human action, purposeful behavior to attain goals in a world of scarcity, that the choices that stem from this always have unseen hidden costs. Now, sometimes those costs are a lot greater than others. I would argue that the costs of the U.S. government taking billions of dollars from the taxpayers in World War II and redistributing it to military interests rather than allowing the taxpayers themselves to invest and spend in, in uh, you know, commercial activity that would interest them... I would argue that this is a much more serious opportunity cost than, say, going to, when 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 uh, Steve grows an apple and is not reading a book. You know, <laughs> that's that's not quite the same as when it's operated on a massive societal level by states, by governments, by people in power. Anyway, that's all way ahead of where we need to be right now. What we're talking about is economics, and this brings us to the end of our conversation for today. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this podcast, and we'll continue to listen next time. I'll see you then.